Yeah, the eyes and the curiosity of the world have turned to Brazil in the face of the political episodes of the last three years that culminated in the election of Jair Bolsonaro that many call the Trump of the tropics. I know you want me to talk about him, but to better understand of Brazil, I will first talk about the Brazilian Roosevelt or Mussolini or whatever populist politician from the, from the 30s that you want to pick. They all did the same at all. Far beyond the revolutionary mindset, there was, was a deeper Brazil, the genuine and truthful Brazil, the conservative, traditionalist, Roman Catholic Apostolic Brazil, neither right or left wing, the Brazil of the baronial manors, the long lines of imperial palm trees, of the Baroque church on the top of the hills, of multiple sugarcane installments and cough plantations, the Brazil of the caboclo of Minas Gerais and São Paulo, the cowboy from the Pampas, the backwoods herdsman of northeastern coast, coast Jangadeiro, of Amazon pioneers' descendants. I love this poem because he, it, it marks the cultural roots of Brazil, which you can see. So this is the Brazilian colonial map. These regions are basically the different occupation fronts of colonial Brazil, which was nothing more than a inheritance of the Catholic social order of medieval Europe that Hans pointed out in his lecture here last year as the closest example of a libertarian social order in the history of mankind. How do we lose it? Three years ago, I gave a lecture about the Vargas era, or the progressive era, called, and I called it the funeral of, of Brazil. On that occasion, I was preceded by the thinker Paulo Cogos, lecture on minimal wage policies and took the opportunity to present to the audience some insights regarding the disastrous effect of these policies in Brazil and how they have destroyed an until that point establishment and in some way harmonic order existing in the mentioned Brazil. To be clear, I want to state how these policies extinguished what was left of the existing Brazil and were responsible to turn this vast country into a plunder and privileged machine where those in control ruthlessly suck the sweat, life, and so from its subjects. And I choose an insight format because this is one of the best advantages I took from Austrian economics. Hence, as taught by the fourth Mrs. Magnum Opus, Theory and History, I bring here non-empirical historical facts analyzed with a, a priori theory light. And why do I call this particular Brazil's funeral? Before answering such question, I want to say that this funeral was filmed and broadcasted, and I began my presentation with images from this gloomy moment. Sorry. As bandeiras representando os estados do Brasil, abolidas pela nova Constituição, enfileiradas aguardam o momento da cremação. Sua Excelência, o presidente Getúlio Vargas, chega ao campo do Rússio para assistir à solenidade. A missa campal, rezada num grandioso altar armado em conjunção com o altar da pátria, foi celebrada por sua eminência, o cardeal Dão Sebastião Leme, acolitado de altos dignatários da igreja. Terminada a missa campal, teve lugar a cerimônia do hasteamento da bandeira nacional pelo presidente da república, sendo hasteado ao mesmo tempo, em 22 março, o pavilhão nacional simbolizando os 22 estados. Tira é feita a cremação das bandeiras estaduais. Temos motivos de sobra para encarar os dias futuros com otimismo e confiança. 
Atravessamos períodos difíceis no passado, com as forças dispersas e malbaratadas, as rivalidades regionais e as instituições inadequadas aumentavam a desorganização política e administrativa. Abolimos as bandeiras e escudos estaduais e municipais, os hinos regionais e os partidos políticos. Tudo isso se fez visando consolidar a unidade política e social do Brasil em uma época em que tais medidas pareciam temerárias. As you can see, it's a elevation of the national flag against all the regional identities that we previously had in, in Brazil. Thirty. Ninety this, this this ceremony was 32 or 33, the end of 32 and or beginning of 33, because uh, I, I, I didn't mention in my previous speech, but uh, there is a separatist war in Brazil where the richest state, São Paulo, try to be independent of the Union. And, and Vargas won this war, the national unity won this war against São Paulo, and did this to smash all regional in the identities in Brazil. So, the Vargas era is generally known as the period from the 30 to 45, but it, it actually lasts until today and, re be and beginning could be placed even further before, with the beginning of the Republic in 1989. In the article, The Ghost That Haunts Brazil, Professor Anthony Miller refers to how positivism permeates the whole Brazilian Republic history with its social engineer plans since 1989. Uh, so th the ideas of positivism permeates all the Republican history in Brazil. And it's funny because in Brazil we have the positivist church. It's still alive and working on. And as a, a separatist look at the map of South America before and after the Republican revolutions, may think that we were on the right track to find that what was once, uh, once only Portugal and Spain has split into several republics uh, in Spanish America and a federation of states in Brazil. But the truth is that the republican movements were a path towards the centralization of hundreds of small towns, cities and regions that enjoyed great autonomy from the Spanish and Portuguese crowns. It was in the context of the revolutions of enlightenment inspirations that the Republican Cup took place overthrowing the monarchy in Brazil. Enlightenment ideals penetrated this Catholic empire in two ways. The first was with the sons of the Brazilian elite going to study abroad and get in touch with the new fashion in European universities. The second way was by the military class of the army formed by the, for the War of Paraguay in 1864 and 70, to, to 70. The preponderant military force had always been the Navy and the National Guard attached to the monarchy. With the Paraguayan War, Brazil strands its army of civilian leaders. He got the fact that the Republican Military Cup in 1889 was planned and ex executed by positivist Freemason. It's a copy and paste from the American Republican model. The country was renamed the United States of Brazil Parliamentarians were elected by district, and you can see the image of the new flag of the country. They were not creative at that time. It's important to note that until the official beginning of the Vargas era, the old republic preser preserved some balance and regional autonomy of the states as the oligarchs from Sao Paulo and Minas Gerais took turns in the national power with the so-called cough and milk policy. As these states were the major contributors to federal budget, they controlled it and don't interfere in other states' local matters. So the state's autonomy prevailed in the old republic, but not as it was in the colonial or imperial Brazil, when in various moments there were local coinage 
hardly a state revenue were transferred to another state and arbitration were resolved by local judges. These are, are coined, printed in each state uh, uh, house of coins. That's we, how we call it in Brazil. However, despite this relative balance, the centralization embryo was impregnated. Upheavals during this period already gave us signs of this. The tenantist was a movement of military of first and second tier level that demanded greater centralization of states, uniformity of legislation, and tax system, and would dictate the direction of unification of Brazil until today. All of them educated in the positive, positivist mindset. Breaking out in the 20s with various rebellions and revolutions, and the most iconic being the 24 revolution. And why do I call it the most iconic? In this revolution, which lasts about 30 days, Sao Paulo city is dominated by the revolutionaries and the province president, subdued with bombing the industrial workers' neighborhoods. That gives us a clue about the agglutinating forces to overcome the old republic. And there we can clearly note the growing syndicalism of a Sao Paulo that had already become an industrial city. Vargas didn't support the tenantist attempts, but when he runs for president election, all these tenantists support him and he loses the election and the tenantist move was tired. So Vargas ran a coup d'etat and grants amnesty to all his 20 tenantist revolutionaries. The devastating Vargas era show what is all about right in its beginning, creating in 30 the Minister of Labor, Industry and Commerce, following the plan to syndicalize and formalize the business and labor elites. In 31, he decreed a syndication of the patronal and employees classes. Thereafter, follows the creation of social security in 35, minimum wage law in 36, labor justice in 39, and culminating with the labor laws consolidation in 43. We can understand the Vargas Cup as a way to accelerate the centralization project, which was very slow during the old republic and accomplished the power to take over by the already dawning syndical workers and patronal forces in the nation. He, talks, he, talks, he takes over the presidency and become a tool of what we might call syndical oligarchies, and these oligarchies will concentrate powers and privileges, destroying the Brazil society of the time. One of the great myths about the current Brazilian demographic configuration is that the Northeast migration that begins in the 30s, intensifies during the 40s, and has its peaks in the 60s, is due to the great drought in the bushland. For one thing, the most obvious observation is that the Northeast bushland always struggled with droughts, periods, and in the past, they were not able to expel the regional population. Here I show it's not you supposed to read this, but just a small list of the drought since the Brazilian discovery. Without appealing to uh, uh, advanced praxeological knowledge, anyone can suspect the coincidence of this migration taking place at the same time the labor laws were being imposed and strengthened. And now, let's be plain, labor laws are labor costs imposed over the worker, and when you impose an additional cost to work by the irrevo irrevocable law of marginal costs, the less productive workers will be automatically eliminated from the labor market. The costs imposed to work by Vargas only aimed to protect the powerful Southeast, South Southeast syndicates from competition with cheaper works from North Northeast. We can notice that in marginal cost displacements, everybody goes one step below. So the more productive workers replaces the second more productive worker and so on. Hence, the less productive ones 
were crushed by these costs. Another argument that is not valid is that Vargas was responsible for the Brazilian industrialization. This is part of the state propaganda clouding, the true to this very day, as Bastiat teaches us, there is what is seen and what is unseen. Vargas creates several based state companies supplying raw materials to industry. But this is a, a different way to do the same, subsidize one pre-existing industry sector that already demanded subsidies. By the pressure of its political powers. Previously, in its market-driven industrialization, the homogeneous growth occurred all over the country, and there was a growing capital market with significant stock exchanges in many states of Brazil that fostered this economic development. Therefore, following the global trend of this time, Vargas steered the economy to the business and trade syndicates friends of the state. It's fascism, the 20th century winner ideology being implemented in Brazil too. The social consequences of, uh, from this power and wealthy concentrator system couldn't be more harmful. I have begun mentioning migration and I will stick to it. The first visible source of the, of the total destruction of the urban sh scenario in, Brazil's, in Brazilian cities. Brazilian cities were colonial pearls that underwent totally disfiguration from 30s and more accentually from 50s. On one hand, São Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, hitherto cities emotionally European with its tropical charm, received a disproportional amount of immigrants or migrants coming in a fully disorderly way, creating concentrations of misery. The Northeast capital cities also received contingents for which they were not ready and could not ever be. The Brazilian city's chaotic urbanization is the first visible strike of this complete derangement caused by labor marginal costs imposed by Vargas. But people, this is Sao Paulo in the 20s. This is Sao Paulo nowadays. But that is the best part. That's Sao Paulo and Rio. But people doesn't migrate without a course and information transmitted by the market. The concentration wasn't only of people, but also investments. The South and Southwest patronal oligarchy also benefited from the syndicalism and the attained subvention, whether in the form of raw material industries or nationalist protectionism. So in the South Southwest states, we have an investment hypertrophy. While in the North Northeast states, we have an anemia. And this became the rule for the next decades to this day. A city conurbation with 21 million inhabitants is, a, is an abomination for, from whatever point of view. We can see similar cities in China, India, which are examples of how not to do urbanism. The public and the private investments concentrate in the southeast because major investments cannot appeal to an official, of an official labor. Thus, they had to be wherever there was the workforce that compensate the costs and the Brazilian industrial park that could be evenly spread all over the country and concentrated in the great Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. I used to say that we could have Chinese growth rates in the Brazilian Northwest from the 30s and the 50s, taking advantage of the workforce low costs. The investments could be spread by a natural market process, searching for lower costs. If you ever had a Northwest drought, it was of investments and jobs, not rain and water. However, beyond the scope of this development, Instead of taking advantage of such conditions to grow, the less productive came to, came to south, occupying unproductive jobs like condo, condo doorman and housemaid. Entire generations had, and still have, their productive lives wasted in ludicrously 
banal, ta banal tasks such as remove dust, making beds, or open doors and receive the mail to a middle class that mimics the lifestyle reserved only for the richest. Brazil is one of, of the few countries where these professions are massive to the point of alter the residence's architecture with made bedrooms and sentry houses. On one hand, an extremely spoiled middle class, incapable to fry an egg at, by the age of 40, and on the other hand, a workforce, workforce contingent that could be producing goods and, serv and service truly relevant on the margin of the market. The Brazilian tragedy goes through analyzing this phenomenon, and up to now, Nobody thinks about blaming this scourge on Vargas. The migration is not a simple displacement in search of jobs that happens without changing the previous social structure. As mentioned above, Northeast migrants settled in clusters surrounding the big cities in South Southeast and abandoned several North Northeast cities, emptying then thus affecting a Brazilian time-lasting balance of priest per capita. The Brazilian cities, originating over a colonial urbanism, were born, born and growth around the Catholic Church. Basically, virtually like a Brazilian soap opera scenario, upon the parish foundation followed the bandstand, the town square, and the rest of the cities surrounding it. Arriving to the metropolis, these people were orf orphans of faith. And it is exactly in these clusters where arise the new Pentecostal denominations that nowadays account for more than half of believers in many cities. This faith vacuum experimented by migrants was fulfilled by new Pentecostal denominations, curiously influenced by the Pentecost Pentecostal arrived in 1890, part of a movement that began, began with the Old Republic advent, which had frontal opposition to the Catholic Church. Once again, we have an example of how Vargas altered what was the Brazil to something we now see very clearly. This faith emptiness is a fracture that will take centuries to be recovered. The British thinker Roger Scruton was recently in Brazil and repeated a myth that spread in schools and universities that Brazil's problem is its Iberian and Catholic colonization as opposed to the British and Protestant colonization. I beg to differ and let the, image make my, the images make my defense. This is our poor Catholic and monarchical architecture and this is what came with the new Pentecostal. I can see, oh, oh, sorry. As you can see, what is the most beautiful? It's strange coming from Scruton that he has the build matters subject. So, what's about the Brazilian Baroque and what we got now? Oh my God, what happens? A virtually ignored effect from this Catholic Church decay in Brazil is the freak show that Brazilian first names had become. By losing the Catholic benchmark and with the family ties dismantled, reference turned out to be, on the one hand, the new influence from the showbiz TV culture, the foreignism, the celebrities, and on the other hand, the Old Testament. The saint's name have disappeared in the Brazil scenario. So it's, it, it's the funniest thing that it's not right like it's spelled. It's like it, you hear it. So the mother puts the name of Diane like that because it's how we, we, you say it, not how you write it. Michael, there's that football player. I don't know if you could get is Hollywood, means Hollywood. So we have 130,000 different first names in Brazil. 
and 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 digging on this subject, I found that maybe the only good law made by a modern state in Portugal, the government has a list of names that Portuguese are allowed to give to their kids just to avoid the tragedy that happens in Brazil. I did my homework on democracy, the God that failed, where hope highlights a detail that should not remain unnoted to closer observers. The names of the triumphant parties from the democratic era, or the progressive era, here, as in the rest of the world, we can note this phenomenon, which itself can say a lot. Everything I might say. In the brochure I put on the table to you, you can see after the 30s how the parties' names have switched. And you always will have a D or S in this party, party's name because it's social, democratic, and previous only Republican Party, and Previous, the Republican is conservative, liberal, and there is a different name like uh, agitated liberal. It was actually a party name in the imperial time. Note that the Vargas uh, party's name, it's like a vortex had swept it away the whole past. The shift was so abrupt that none from the old Republican preeminent figure managed to return to political scene with some significant significance after the 30s, or after 45, with the Vargas fall. The entire national politics was renewed now with a new establishment in charge. The remaining aristocracy and many members from the old republic were part of a genuine aristocracy. Elite was replaced by a syndical oligarchy founded on the military roots of positivism. As I mentioned, the Vargas era goes far beyond his personal tenure. It was no overstanding to say that it extends to this very day, not only a state model, but having the same syndical labor or paternal oligarchy. Even with government falls and the 64 military government, we can note, see, note see that on the national politics, is a continuity since the 30s. The entire Brazilian political establishment is a product and a byproduct follower of the Vargas era. This is the motto that endures and prevails until today, the motto from the victorious ideology of the 20th century. Our Italian fellows can, can say it better. Everything in the state, nothing outside the state. It's Mussolini's. Quote, it's, it's not good to our, to our libertarian health, mental health, to repeat it because it states so many times in this simple quote. But how of this, all of this was achievable? How to crush the poorest and the, productiv the productive class, to concentrate power in hands of an oligarchy, to whip off the map the ancient regime? and to keep the power of this establishment for decades, decades up to now. Oh, I, I don't know if it's readable. I try to make a, a French old style. But, but it's, it's Murray's uh, point on uh, the Etienne de la Boutie, the discourse of voluntary servitude, that reminds us that people consent with despotism. And the establishment of a tyranny is more complicated in the beginning. The Vargas era uh, started with a coup of d'état, a coup d'état, but uh, uh, it, it, it imposed itself by the propaganda. Uh, not so subtle in the beginning, because he created a department of press and propaganda, but he is subtle in changing the cultural shift and forge a, a fake national identity. One of the sectors selected to make it happen was the carnival, the famous Brazilian carnival. It is curious to note that carnival, hitherto an anarchical and disorganized celebration, was turned to resemble the military parades beginning to take 
use of infantry musical instruments from the 30s. You can't say what's the difference between a military parade and a new carnival parade that we have in Brazil. It's interesting to note that the first lyrics of the first 30s sambas was uh, all about uh, national identity glorification that we never had before in Brazil. The private press had always been the official press as well. We had his Vargas connected connection with the first radio and television and following the decade of this first friend, Assis Chateaubriand, the global organization already in the 70s took this place. This is the principal newspaper in Brazil. As you can see, the motto of the newspaper is a newspaper at the service of Brazil, not for a service of the reader, as we suppose to imagine. The whole media, establishment media, is about this centralization propaganda. It's easy to, say, to, to, to know how he did it. This is also a list that you are not supposed to read. These are the politicians that owns radio and TV broadcasting in Brazil. It's big. It's really big. It's not just uh, a coincidence that the Brazil richest family would be the Marinho's global network owner. In a recent Forbes list, they are ranked with something around $30 billion wealth. Is this machine that sustains and keeps with tons of propaganda a completely artificial national identity that binds an even more artificial array of national unity. I show here a, an actor that made a film in the 70s that he went to all over Brazil. And look, let's take a look about his opinion. Oh, no. <laughs> Você acha que é possível fazer um programa para crianças numa televisão aberta de alfabetização? Seja louco. Eu, eu, quando fiz Bebê Brasil, eu tinha a impressão de que o Brasil se divide em cinco países. O meu sentimento era de que o Brasil não existiria muito tempo junto. Nós seríamos cinco países, cada um com seu presidente, sua Câmara de Deputados e Senadores, etc., porque... O Brasil era muito distinto, era muito separado. O Brasil do Amazonas era um Brasil até oposto ao Brasil do Rio Grande do Sul. Passados uns 15, 20 anos, eu voltei a essas regiões e percebi que o Brasil ia continuar, pelo menos por algum tempo, junto. E que a gente devia isso à televisão. A televisão brasileira, entre outras coisas, é claro ajudou a integração do país, integrou o Brasil. Hoje, eu acabei de vir do Acre, o Acre é tão Brasil quanto o Rio Grande do Sul. Mas a televisão integrou o Brasil para o pior e para o melhor. Integrou o Brasil para aquilo que de pior se pode oferecer e de melhor se pode oferecer. Evidentemente, o de pior ganha. O de pior ganha com a coisa da maçã podre no cesto, o de pior ganha. Então, acho difícil, nesse momento, que a gente possa realizar, é, a curtíssimo prazo, a médio prazo, um programa inteligente que corrompa a desinteligência instituída em geral. Acho difícil, mas acho que é necessário. Acho que... So, you can see that uh, only we, we here, at, at least myself, I had to study a lot to understand that. And the actors, they can feel it. That's the ability that only an actor can. We, we are all aware that we can take the polit political opinions from actors. But it's not a political opinion, it's a perception that he had running the whole country that it's attached only because of the television propaganda. The Brazilian before was different in your very regions. Finally, 
in one last insight, I submit, I submit an opposite view from the last presidential election. Uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I claimed that the regime sucks even the subject's souls. I meant that the map red side and as the Scottish side favoring the English domination maintenance wasn't the winner. They might have kept the, uh, the allowance and we can understand that they vote, they vote with their pockets. But did they really won, win? The dependents first thing that it kills is the subject's soul. It's pride. Soul is vanished by electing their very tormentor that keep them in this dependency state. These people lost even their self's pride. The unification pro process is a domination imposed for the strongest against the weaker neighbor, just like the power of syndicates eliminating the competition. All unification process can be seen as this. I put an Italian map that is the similar but the inverted map of Brazil, where the powerful syndicates of the north wants to eliminate his very close competition, which are the southest, cheapest workers. The same thing happens in Brazil. But the Milano, Torino, the cities from Italy, and I suppose the German also, the German unification also has the same process. These cities in Europe were lucky because when this process occurred in, in Europe, the losers of this process had America to flee. So the immigration was all about that. The losers came to America. The Northeast people from Brazil, they had not the same lucky. There is not other continent to go. So that's why you have completely lunatic cities or urbanism in Sao Paulo and Rio. These people came to cluster in the south cities. And now we reach the recent the 30 years of election in Brazil. And you can see how it's going to separating the country even more each election, the red side and the blue side. The Northeast are the winner of the last election till the last one with Bolsonaro. There is no coincidence when I put the colonial map and the actual electoral map now. The great Sao Paulo in the colonial era was the productive part of Brazil, the richest one. And the Northeast stayed with the left because the left gives, uh, gives them the pensions. So the Northeast are the victims of the process, even winning 30 years of elections. What to expect about Bolsonaro? We don't know. The opposition, as in the brochure, only won three elections in Brazil. The first one, with Jânio Quadros, as you can see, last seven months, he was forced to renounce. The second one, with Collor, Fernando Collor de Mello, last two years, he was impeached. And now we had the third victory of an opposition candidate in Brazil with Bolsonaro. That is an interrogation point at the end because we don't know if the establishment will let him do what he has to do. So far, he is doing what the previous oppositions did. He is doing basic economics housewife would do in its house when it's going bad. He's cutting the spending, trying to make a surplus of the government and privatizing company to reduce the debt. So far, so good. But it, uh, I would like to, to think that it's because I start a Mrs. Institute 10 years ago and we had an influence and Brazil will become a libertarian paradise. But actually, uh, uh, I'm sure that 30 years of left-wing spend government creates much more libertarian than a hope
book or anything that we can do. So the Brazilian right way of economics is just a matter of need. It's, it doesn't have any other option. And it is a clue because will the Congress or the establishment let Bolsonaro do what he has to do? We don't know. I let it to the future and thank you very much. <laughs>